Greetings and welcome to today's video presentation. I hope all is going well with you. I'm going to attempt today to uh, respond to a bunch of inquiries about tone stacks. It might take a little time and effort to do this, so it, this may be broken up into two separate videos. We'll see how it turns out. Uh, but I'm going to try to cover all the bases to give you a good practical knowledge of what tone stacks are and how they work. Rusty, are you about ready to get to work here? You ready to take this camera and start doing some photography work? Or you just want to gnaw on that nasty old rawhide bone? Well, I guess we got our answer. Let's start off with a brief discussion of the two different types of tone control. First is the active type, in which desired frequencies are actually boosted or increased in volume, while the other frequencies are not affected. You can crank up the treble, you can crank up the bass. When you do, the volume of the treble or the volume of the bass will actually increase. Therefore, the overall effect on gain is that the signal gets louder because you have boosted some of the frequencies within the signal. Now in passive, the undesired frequencies are reduced or eliminated and the desired frequencies are not affected. So if you decide that you want to increase the bass in a tube amp, generally you will eliminate some of the treble. Okay, now, uh, then I think you can see that the effect on gain is going to be that the gain is reduced because this is the absolute opposite of the active method of tone control. And that is we've eliminated some of the frequencies in the signal. Therefore, the overall gain or volume of the signal will go down. Now, if you compensate for that by turning up the volume on the amp, then you could look at this as an indirect boosting of the desired frequencies. First, you eliminate the undesired. We'll say we, we are going to filter out some of the treble. Then, because the volume went down a little, we turn it up. And when we do, what's left in the signal is bass and mid-range. So when we turn the volume up, we're going to actually be indirectly boosting those desired frequencies. So I hope all this made sense. Uh, the two methods of tone control are absolute opposites. Uh, the active will actually boost desired frequencies uh, and increase gain. The passive eliminates undesired frequencies and reduces gain. Active is found in solid state, integrated circuit uh, devices and amplifiers. The passive type of tone control tends to be found in tube amps. Rusty. Are you ready to grab this camera and get to work? Are you going to help me with this video, Rusty? I need an answer. How about it? Uh, I guess not. Next, let's look at the placement of the tone stack. And there are a bunch of different places you can put it. Uh, the choices range from here in the beginning of the circuit to all the way down here at the end of the preamp circuit just before the phase inverter. Now, just to give uh, examples of the two different extremes, uh, we have to look no further than the uh, venerable Fender Basement Amp. Uh, in the different circuit designs of this amp, they have placed the tone stack in uh, several different locations. In the AA864 basement, the tone stack is placed right here between the first and second stages of the preamplification circuit. Now this is as early as it gets in the circuit. Uh, you see here we have the first half of the 7025 or 12AX7 uh, preamplifies the signal a bit and then immediately here because this is a passive tone stack we're going to start eliminating some frequencies and then pass what's left on to the second preamplification stage, the third, and then on to the phase inverter. Now since we know that there is volume loss associated with our tone stack, because it's passive, we're only eliminating frequencies and we're not boosting any, uh, we have to be able to compensate for this loss of volume. 
And that's why we have uh, second and third preamp stages here to make up for the loss of volume that occurred in the early placed tone stack. And that's the advantage of this type of tone stack, is that you have uh, subsequent stages of amplification to make up for the volume loss. Uh, the disadvantage of this type of placement is that you're only affecting the tone of this output here from the first preamp stage. You have no control over the tone here, here, or down uh, stream in the circuit. So, uh, yes, we can compensate for volume, but no, this does not give us a really good overall uh, regulation of the tone in the circuit. Now let's look at a second alternative, and that is to place the tone stack very far along in the circuit. Uh, it's way down here just before the phase inverter. Okay, so we do not uh, affect the tone of the signal until after it's gone through one, two, three stages of preamplification. We do have uh, one stage of amplification here after the tone stack, which is the first portion of the 12AX7, and then we go straight into the cathodyne phase inverter. So this will compensate a little bit for the loss of volume, okay, and remember the advantage if we place it later in the circuit, we have a much better overall control of the tone of the first three stages of preamplification. But what they found is when you place the tone control this late, you really have a hard time making up for the volume loss so they developed a method called a, ca a cathode follower. And this, as we will see, is going to compensate for the loss of volume by placing the tone stack so late in the circuit. I think everybody's heard of the term cathode follower, and there's a lot of, uh, I think, uncertainty about it. I'm sure there's people out there that know way more than I know about it. But here will be my rather simple approach to understanding cathode followers. Now, most tubes, uh, you'll see, you will have the output from the plate, and that will be fed into the grid of the next tube. Now, here we have the output of the plate of the 12AY7. We pick an unusual tube. You notice this is not a 12AX7 like you're used to seeing, but a 12AY7. We uh, input the signal to the grid, it comes out of the plate and does indeed go to the grid of the second half of the 12AY7. But look at this. The signal is passed on to the next uh, stage of amplification, which is this 12AX7, not from the plate. The plate is connected down here, in effect grounded, down to the B-plus circuit. And the output is from the cathode of the tube, hence the term cathode follower. So if you see in any amp circuit a rather unusual tube, like a 12AY7, and uh, also where you see that the output from the tube is from the cathode, not from the plate, then you have a cathode follower. Now what is the advantage of this type of circuit? Well, when you output from the plate, we all know that plates tend to run at real high voltage. They could be 4, 450 volts. That's a high impedance signal. Okay, now high impedance signals uh, tend to lose a lot of gain when they're run through a passive tone stack. So if we had come out of the plate and fed the tone stack, it would eat up our volume it would take a large percentage of the volume away from the signal. But when we feed the tone stack from the uh, cathode of the tube, uh, we have here a low uh, impedance signal. It is a lot of current, but not a lot of voltage coming out of the cathode. And the tone stack, when it encounters a low impedance input does not take as much volume away from the signal. So by putting this 
cathode follower just before the tone stack. We're changing the signal from high impedance to low impedance and avoiding a, a great loss of gain by uh, running it through the passive tone stack. It's a little trick here and it really helps to preserve the volume uh, and overall gain of the amplifier as it goes through the passive tone stack. Then as I said we feed into the first uh, half of the 12AX7, we'll boost the signal a little more so whatever loss we had in the passive tone stack with the low impedance uh, input from the cathode follower will make up for here and then we will go into our uh, cathodyne phase inverter and feed our two 606 output tubes. The advantage of this system we have great overall tone control of the first two stages of preamplification. There's almost no amplification in a cathode follower so uh, here being late in the circuit we have really great overall tone control but we have to incorporate a kind of zero gain tube here to uh, change the impedance of the signal to compensate for the passive tone stack being placed late in the circuit. I hope that makes some sense. Here is Rusty's nemesis, the furry kitty. Uh, she's anxious to take over his photography job, I'm sure. Kitty, are you ready to take over the camera work on this video? Uh, guess not. Now let's take a look at some fairly simple general rules that govern how tone controls work. And this will be the passive tone controls. Okay, first, capacitors we know will pass alternating current and they block direct current. Okay, now I want you to think of um, alternating current in an unusual way. And that is the higher the frequency of the alternating current, the more alternating it is. Okay, think about that. Isn't it altering its uh, polarity uh, more rapidly than a low frequency signal? On the other side of the coin, if you have a very low frequency signal, it's more like direct current. What is the frequency of direct current? Uh, zero cycles per second. So the lower the frequency, the closer it is to direct current. The higher the frequency, the more it is easily identified by the capacitor as alternating current. Hence, here, general rule, uh, 1A. The higher the frequency, as we just discussed, the more alternating the current is, so the easier the high frequency alternating current will pass through the capacitor. Let's take a look at a 0 0.1 microfarad capacitor and let's input uh, like a 0 to 20,000 cycle per second signal to the capacitor. From about 0 to 500 hertz, almost none of those frequencies will pass. From around 500 to 3000, they're going to start passing through, and the higher, or the closer they get to 3000, the higher percentage will get through. At around 6 or 700 cycles per second, we might only pass 10%. <clears throat> At 3000 cycles per second, we're up to around 90%. Once we get over 3,000 cycles per second with a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, we're going to pass 100% of the signal because the capacitor is not confused. It knows that that's alternating current and allows it through. Here, it's not so sure, so it doesn't allow it to pass. I know it sounds weird, but uh, you don't have to be purely direct current to be blocked by a capacitor. If your frequency is low enough, the capacitor will treat you like you are direct current. Next rule is, the lower the value of the capacitor, okay, 10 picofarads, say, as opposed to 10 microfarads, the higher the frequency it passes. So let's just say it this way, capacitors get real picky 
the smaller they are. So when you go way down in capacitance, you're going to make them more and more selective about what they think alternating current really is. If I use a 0.1 microfarad capacitor like I did up here, uh, it will not pass 100% of the frequencies until those frequencies are around 3,000 cycles per second. Let's go to a one-tenth value capacitor. Instead of 0.1 microfarads, it's 0.01. One-tenth. Well, 3,000 cycles is no longer going to get through. Neither is 10, neither is 15, neither is 20. They will get through in an increasing percentage, just like these did up here. But you will not get 100% passage through the capacitor unless you're a frequency of 30,000 cycles per second or higher. So it's a See, there's a, a fairly simple rule of thumb here. If you go to one-tenth the capacitance, the frequency threshold goes up ten times. So a one-tenth capacitance value here requires ten times the uh, frequency to get through at a 100% uh, level. I hope that makes sense. Let's carry this in another direction. Let's go up in capacitance. Let's go to a 10 times greater capacitor, which would be 1 microfarad. And I think you'll see then that it will pass 100% of all frequencies that are at or above 300 cycles per second. Okay, one, t uh, one tenth of this. Then let's go to 10 microfarads here. And I think you'll see that you would pass, it would pass 100% of frequencies that are way down at 30 cycles per second. So a 10 microfarad capacitor is really not very discriminatory about the frequency, whereas a 0.01 microfarad capacitor really is. Okay, let's use our knowledge now of, of capacitors and how they handle different frequencies and make two different types of filter. These filters are the key ingredients, okay, the basis for all passive tone controls. First, we're going to make a high pass filter. Uh, we're going to put a capacitor in series with our signal path. The signal's coming in here, out here. And we're going to run a branch off of that uh, circuit and run it south here to ground and run it through a resistor. Now, uh, I think as you can guess, depending on the value of this capacitor and this resistor, this high pass filter will pass different frequencies. But let's just look at this on a general basis. Here comes our signal with all different frequencies. And we know that the capacitor will not pass low frequencies very well, okay, unless it's 10 microfarads, and in this case it isn't. Okay, say it's a 0.01. Low frequencies will be blocked. They can't get through because the capacitor thinks they look too much like direct current. It passes the high frequencies on through. The high frequencies see the resistor here. Uh, it's not an appealing path for them. They continue on. Uh, through the circuit and uh, go on to the different stages of amplification. Now let's look here at a quick graph. And here is frequency down here on the x-axis. So as the frequency increases, here at like one or two cycles per second, it's completely blocked because here is our output. The higher you are here, the more output uh, is, is occurring uh, through the circuit. Okay, so we're going through until we reach the cutoff frequency or the threshold at which 100% of the uh, frequencies will be allowed to pass. Now if we had a 0.1 microfarad capacitor right here, we know that this cutoff frequency would be at about 3,000 cycles per second. So anything below 3,000 cycles per second will be attenuated. As you remember, on our chart here, if you're down around 500, only 10% gets through, way down here. 
it, the closer you get to 3,000, you'll get up to around 90%. So here we're almost at 3,000. We're at around 90% output. And then once we reach 3,000, all the signals at or above 3,000 pass through it at 100%. Now let's look at a low pass filter, just the opposite. And in this case, we're going to, since it's the opposite, let's arrange our components in opposite order. Let's put the resistor first, and then on our little uh, side road here, let's put the capacitor going to ground. Okay, here comes our signal from 0 to 20,000 cycles per second. Uh, both of the frequencies will pass through the resistor, but the high frequency sees the capacitor going to ground as a very tempting low resistance uh, route to ground and takes it. So our high frequencies turn right and head south. The low frequencies will pass on through, hence the name low pass filter. And I think it should come as no surprise, our frequency output graph is just the opposite. Here's our low frequencies passing through uh, at 100%. And now finally we get up to where our frequencies, uh, where the frequencies become high enough that first like 5, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100% of them are sent to ground. So the higher the frequencies are, the more likely they are to go to ground through the capacitor. And you can see the results of that. If you're at three, 0 to 3,000 cycles per second, you're going to zoom on through if this is a 0 0.1 microfarad capacitor. If you're above 3,000 cycles per second, look what happens. More and more and more as you get higher and higher, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 20,000 will all be sent to ground. Now let's talk about something that's rarely discussed and is to me very confusing, and that is what's the purpose of the resistor? In both cases it looks like the capacitor is doing all the work. Here it's eliminating the low frequency and allowing the high frequency to pass. Here it's allowing the high frequency to go to ground and allowing the low frequency to pass. What the heck does the resistor do? First let me say that the purpose uh, of the resistor and how it interacts with the capacitor is really beyond the scope of this discussion. I could spend 30 minutes explaining to you the fine nuances of how they interact, but I think five minutes in you all would be watching the Russian pole dancer video instead of this one. So I'm going to keep it short and sweet. The value of the resistor can be selected. It can be higher or lower. And when it, you do pick that value, you're fine-tuning the filtering capability of the capacitor. This is a way to fine-tune the capacitor. Okay, you can pick different values here and different frequencies will pass through and it gives you the ability to really fine-tune what frequencies pass through and what frequencies go to ground. Okay, uh, I hope that's, that's basic and to be honest that's probably all you need to know. Well, that about does it for part one of this two-part video series. Please stay tuned for part two in which we will directly compare the Fender and Marshall tone stacks and we'll take a look at the audio spectrum from both of these amplifiers. And I'll even throw in a Vox for good measure. I assure you it will be surprising. So I'll see you then. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.